Uh, it's an honor to be here to take part in this uh, fantastic celebration in, in 2015 here that's uh, going to put uh, Samuel Holland on the map. Uh, Samuel Holland put us on the map and now we're going to put him on the map and, and through this year celebrate his many accomplishments. It's a, uh, a topic you choose is to say, well, it's the journey of this clock. And I think we're going to go on uh, on quite a journey because it's an amazing story. And the more you get into it, it, it's just simply so much history. I often think uh, if one could follow that clock where it went, uh, you'd meet a heck of a lot of people. So uh, the subject is the journey of the clock the astronomical clock and its journey itself. Where did it start out? It started out in, in London, in England. The first leg, it went across the ocean to Quebec City. And at that point, it darn near didn't make it here. It almost went on the rocks. So miraculously, the clock had a lot of uh, travel time ahead. And now the next spot is Quebec City to Port Joy, as it was known in those days, or Fort Amherst. And there it was at Observation Cove at Fort Amherst, and uh, that's where they set up to start doing their work. So after that experience, the clock started to go on its journey to complete the survey, and it went on to Cape Breton. And it also uh, spent a lot of time in Quebec as well. And then it returned to PEI and the Holland residence in Tryon area and Summerside. There, it left Summerside, sadly, and went to the US. And then it made its third and fourth trips to PEI exhibitions. So uh, that's what we're going to kind of follow today. That's just a, a, an outlay of the journey of the clock. So that is a picture of Samuel Holland. Many have seen that. And this is interesting because this is the, the start that shows going across the Atlantic. And as I said, they darn near lost the ship close to shore. And then it went up the St. Lawrence River to Quebec City. Mm -hmm. And from Quebec City, the ship basically got all the survey equipment together, got all the crew, and headed down to Port Joy, Port Amherst. And as David mentioned, uh, it did stop off in Tignish area and put the first survey crew. So there's some bragging rights for West Prince. Now the ship to cancel, that was the survey ship that took the clock across the Atlantic Ocean. And it's easy to say, if you wanted to trace the clock, you trace the voyage of the Kensel, which, which was with Samuel Holland for all the surveying. So now we see Quebec City, and that would be a, a special place in the, in the Holland history, as Samuel Holland and his wife, Marie Rollette, resided in Quebec City. And it's interesting that at that point, if you follow the dots there where they came down and visited PEI right down the strait, right into Fort Amherst. So Fort Amherst, Port Joy, to me, is one of the most important historical location because that is where 
the British North American Survey started. Charlottetown was the cradle of Confederation. Fort Joy was the cradle of the British North American Survey. Everything learnt there in that first survey is, is the beginning of the whole British North American Survey. And what you see there is Fort, Fort Amherst, Port Joy, that in just a, a kind of a sketch, it's not an official sketch of course, but what it represents is the first survey location. And that was where they arrived in October 1764, and by 17, uh, or by December, they had to actually have their, their observation posts and their living quarters built. Uh, I have some records of that home. They had to buy supplies. And they had to pay people. The remarkable thing about all this survey is the Acadians put the roof on their building. And that started a partnership with the Acadians that would go on and on for the rest of the survey. If you look at that island postcard, that is kind of the cove, Holland Cove. And if you go inwards there, you'll see to the right, you'll see a little hollow in there. And I went down there a few years ago, and it's almost like it is on that. You couldn't even see a building there. There's cottages nestled in the woods. And directly behind that, you will find the monument that's down there, which honors the survey, Parks Canada Monument. So that is, is a special spot. And there is the clock as we see it, the clock that's going to come to the Confed Center. Now, Faye Pound wrote an art, uh, a, a article in the journal way back in uh, 2001, around that time. And I'll just quote a few things from Faye Pound's article here. The clock was an instrument used by Major Holland to measure longitude in a survey of the St. John and early name for PEI, which St. John was. It was used as a basis for organizing and doing the readings from the field books and it kind of became the icon of surveying. It was his most important tool, was to have that clock. It's not like a regular clock. The face plate of the Holland clock is polished brass, and it has a small circle in hand that gives the seconds, and a large circle in hands that give the minutes. The upper sector gives the hour of the day and the lower sector the day of the month. The key that winds the clock has a weight on it and controls the long pendulum which, of the grandfather clock. It stands about six feet high. It's made of two kinds of mahogany and it's artistically made and highly polished. And the, the interesting thing about this clock is that the clockmaker died before Samuel Holland got to take it. And the clockmaker was a man by the name of George Graham. He was renowned in Britain for clockmaking, and he's buried in Westminster Abbey. And I think of him when he was a, a person in the, the prime of his artistic ability, would he ever think that clock he was working on would end up in Prince Edward Island and be coming back here 250 years later? So that is the, the clock as it stands. And certainly, it's an icon of, of an artifact, the clock. And, there, and as a result of the survey, you, you see what we got today. It's this beautiful map which defines us as people. And I think it's, uh, I want to thank everybody involved in the committee for what's happening. And 
especially the Confed Center, for what they're bringing in. There's going to be a lot of artifacts that will be of interest come in here. And uh, I'm sure you'll all have the opportunity over the next year to see that. Here we go again. <laughs> now, if you look at, at this particular shot here, that is Samuel Holland's home in Quebec City, which he had from about uh, 1770 until his death in 1801. It was called the Holland Estate. It has a storied history. Well, that's where, the, for many years, uh, the clock was housed in his home. He took it with him everywhere he went. And uh, history records that Prince Edward, when he was stationed in Quebec in the 1790s, he frequently visited the Holland residence. And the clock would be there as an icon again. Interesting, what you see there now is the... It's a map, obviously. It's a diagram. And that's the diagram of the property that I just showed you. That, that estate home. And what you see there, if we look Holland School there at the bottom, and you see a little square, that is where Samuel Holland is buried. And five of his family. Earl Lockerbie did some investigation on that. I was up there several times. And at that location is the Cole Samuel Holland. And on that property was his family's burial spot. And it got desecrated 150 years or so before. And they did a dig, they found a skull, they found some remnants, but they didn't complete the dig. And that's I'm working with the federal government to get the rest of it done. And Betty Howe from Tryon said, you get them, we'll take them down and bury them at Tryon. <laughs> but that's passion, I guess. <laughs> anyway, so as life goes on, the clock keeps traveling. It got to Quebec City, and then Samuel Holland dies in 1801. And this is the spot of that school. You'll see the wrought iron fence. The gentleman next to me is Alex Addy. And he was a chief historian at the old cathedral in Old Town, Quebec. And someone said, you've got to find him. He's got some great information. And it was him that put me on the track of finding that gravesite. And Mr. Addy uh, has passed away five years ago. When I was talking to him, he was 96. And he wanted to jump over that fence because the door was locked. <laughs> so Estelle and I picked him up to take him down to this site to learn where everything is. Well, that was the fastest drive we ever had, going through lights and everything. And we got halfway there, and he says to Estelle, oh, dear, I had a heart attack last year. <laughs> I said to myself, we're both going to have one right now. <laughs> anyway. I respect him for his history because he left us a lot of tips on how to further support this story. So when Marie Roulette, Samuel's beautiful French-Canadian bride, when he died, she was really left without support because uh, the oldest son, John Frederick, was in Charlottetown. And so in the early 1800s, she moved to try on. And I often wonder of Marie Rollette sitting on the banks of the Tryon River, finishing her life and reminiscing everywhere she went with that clock and what a part of her, her life was. So that's the homestead that my mom was brought up on. That was the, the homestead as a young fella. Uh, we all had to work in our house. <laughs> And we had cattle, cattle down there, and uh, I spent a lot of time in that old house, and I spent a lot of time up in the old attic and going through chests of 
different artifacts, things like that. And sadly, that house burnt in 1991. The family by the name of, well, it was Green. They were from Montreal. They bought the house of my mother, and they had brought it up to quite a level of restoration. And unfortunately, it burnt. Now, uh, a little story about that. What would happen in Tryon? It's like a lot of families, right? Everybody gets along just perfect. No, <laughs> not when it comes to antiques. <laughs> well, what happened was there, there was a rivalry developed over the St. Eleanor's Hollands. And my great-great-grandfather had a brother. His brother was A.E. Holland from St. Elmer's. And they would visit, visit back and forth. So usually every time the St. Elmer's Hollands came down to try on, they left with another artifact. So there was a little tension there. So anyway, uh, my great-uncle Cam, who passed away in the 50s, was quite a strong-willed man. The story went that, uh, and I still get it from the seniors in that area, that they come down one Sunday to go to church and of course were planning to take the clock to St. Elmer's. And Cam got pretty mad and apparently they had nice white horses come up, beautiful carriage from St. Elmer's. And so Cam whitewashed them green. <laughs> and on another occasion they come down, he, he, he hooked their horse up backwards. I guess it was some nonverbal stuff going on there. But miraculously, uh, when I look back, the artifacts were, were safer up this way. And for many years, they were in this house. But prior to that, and I don't have a picture of it right now, but I will get one, it was in the Holland homes in St. Elmer's. Marion Holland was a, a daughter, spinster. Uh, she moved in this house, 257 Central Street, right next to Lynn Turtles. And she had quite a, a storied history. If, if you research her, she was known as a very kind and loving woman, especially to the kids. She taught piano, and her routine was to have students over, right in front of the clock, doing their piano lessons. And then she did tours for Parkside School. And I've met a couple of uh, seniors lately that went on those tours. And the late Claudia Rogers said one time, I was on that tour. <laughs> so Claudia was a relative. So it served quite a purpose. But she also, Marion went to Carnegie Hall and played the piano. So to think that we have all that history that was here. The big tragedy, if you want to call it, in, in the journey of the clock, Marion passed away in 1990. And what happened was that she left her will. Many of the Holland artifacts stayed here or in St. Elner's, and we now have them in Charlottetown in the Holland collection. But uh, she sent the piano to Wilcox, California, to a niece who didn't really appreciate the clock. I said, you know. So around that time, what happened was uh, American Airlines were having a 25th year anniversary. And they wanted to have a clock as just an icon, something to refer to for their anniversary. So they bought it from the, from the niece. And then along comes some very people who I hold in self-esteem. And that's uh, George Laird of Surrey. George w Laird, uh, originally, his family came from Tryon. And George Laird is known by some people. He wrote the book saints and sinners united church of summerside he wrote the book historical bedeck but his passion was samuel holland so in the winter times he would get on the train and go up and look for information on holland and that was tedious tedious work because we didn't have computers and all this stuff so 
he was really passionate, and, and you could use the term overzealous. Overzealous is, is, is connected to passion for something that, of value. And he wrote the federal government in the early 60s, and he requested that our clock, Samuel Holland clock, come back to Canada. And Judy LaMarche at the time was the minister that made that happen. There was a celebration in Toronto, and F.J. Thorpe, a renowned historian who's worked with David years ago, uh, he, he was responsible for accepting it. It was in the Maritime Pavilion for Expo 67. And after that, it went to our National Museum in Ottawa. And that's where the clock uh, stays today. But the, the journey, I want to mention, that's my, uh, Howard Clark, that's all right. You can go back there, Paula. Now, that, that is my mother, Ellen Holland Dalton. So we grew up in the Fergie house, which was our home for 40 years. And we had a lot of artifacts that are now in the Holland collection that were in our house. But uh, she was a, an inspiration of, she used to take the kids up to visit Mary in Holland and see the, the clock. And she certainly pushed the, the importance of, and the significance of the clock. But more importantly, as David said, that uh, we sort of got inoculated with history. Most of it was one ear out the other. We're too busy playing baseball <laughs> and things, but the seeds were there. And I think that's important is to, to plant the seeds in, in our youth, the people of the future, so that these types of stories keep going. Now, some people recognize that man. That's Howard Clark. Howard Clark is a descendant of John Clark, the carpenter on the cancel. It was John Clark that would have built with the Acadians and worked on the roof. And Howard is very passionate about the fact that he comes from the survey time. And he also went around and he completed, he's in a manor now, but he did complete all the properties in the Bedeck area where Hollands lived, the descendants of Samuel Holland. So we, we owe a great uh, gratitude to, to Howard. I believe you were there that day, David. Uh, now, this is an interesting picture because it shows the clock. The clock had a strong, you know, it wanted a strong yearning to get back to PEI. So in 1970, the clock came back and it was for the Canadian Museum Association's national convention. Back came the clock and so, You'll see the people that are in that picture. I guess it's it's sorry, right. it's, it's uh, the previous one there. That's uh, Judy Judy McDonald, friend of many in this room, and uh, she was in that photos. And the other gentleman at the time, what he was a curator. Yeah. So that was a partial return of the clock temporarily. Now, this is an extremely interesting picture because what we're really doing with 2015 is recreating a huge exhibit. Well, in uh, 2000, Fay Pound was involved in our historical society and we were trying to figure, everybody wants to celebrate the millennium, well, what could we do? And Faye said, if we could get a clock, it would be significant of time. So I suggested, uh, how about we bring Samuel Holland's clock for another visit? And Faye took the bulb of the horns and made that happen. 
And I want to thank uh, the mayor of the city at that time, Basil Stewart, and the city fathers uh, paid the price, I believe it was $5,000, to bring this clock back. But what we had was totally amazing. If you see that corner there, that would be right here. And Boyd Beck and Noni Frazier, working with Holland College Collection and other artifacts, they made a, a, a tremendous display. When I look at that picture, especially the items, the three items, the liquor decanter, the candlestick, and that plate, and the picture above that, and other things, were what we grew up in, in, in our home. So I, I keep saying now, looking back, I never realized that I was born in a museum. <laughs> I guess some of it had to take. But what was uh, very, very interesting about that at the time, just to the right of that, would have been the clock right here. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's strange. The, you can't notice the candlestick, but uh, my mother noticed it. She visited my uncle's old farm. He had it holding up a window. That's why it had a wow on it. The, uh, the kind of the map desk that's at Holland College now, he thought it had a better use. He was cutting meat on it. So it's totally amazing how, despite that, people hold on to things. This here is a picture of my late brother. We were a year apart. He died uh, in 90. I believe Mike, Michael was 47 at the time. And he worked at Ogilvy's department store in Montreal. And he was a, uh, he ran the antique department, uh, traveled. He used to sit in our parlor and put Mozart on, listen to music. He was going to travel the world. Well, he did. He, he became the top buyer for Ogilvy's department store. And he traveled Europe, buying out castles, right into the, the business. And then uh, it ended up, just one of his customers was a Miriam Holland. She came in the store and he was making her receipt. And, I wonder if there's any connection. So he spoke to her. <laughs> they became best of friends. And she gave him, left to him, 80% of the collection that's in Charlottetown. So, you know, it's funny how you, you lose track of where your relatives are or what they had. So Michael uh, basically made a lot of contributions to, to that collection down there. And his uh, partner, Raymond Martin, he was a pediatrician, also a, a prince of a man. The two of them ensured that most of that collection got here. Unfortunately, he died shortly after my brother. And I still have a few things I'm trying to find that would enhance our collection. And there we see the, the famous sundial from Dartmouth College. And that was quite an accomplishment too because Holland College uh, took, a, took a, a stance and an aggressive one was to visit Dartmouth College and make arrangements to have a replica made. So Dartmouth College actually had the opportunity uh, to send that sundial or, or send the print of it and they commissioned someone in London, England to make an exact copy of that sundial. Now the significance of it was how did it get to Dartmouth College? In 1771, Samuel Holland rode in on horseback to visit Dartmouth College because he was about learning and teaching. And he donated that sundial to Dartmouth College. Anytime they have any historical ceremony at that college, it's with the sundial out. Uh, Estelle and I got to visit that this fall. We got to get in the room where nobody gets in. 
and we had pictures taken there of that sundial. And that was uh, two years ago. We uh, David, two years ago, that was unveiled, and it's in front of Holland College now. So uh, I just want to say that it, it's it's been a journey, and the journey didn't stop there. So we, we came here, we had the big exhibition here, and I want to just add one point about that. We had all of this, this well-curated display here at the front, but all around the walls was Jim McNutt's map collection. We had maps starting in the 1400s and ending with the Holland maps right here. It was an amazing display, and that type of thing is going to come together. So I, I want to say that, uh, again, the journey won't stop here. It'll, it'll keep going, of course, but it's an amazing journey of a clock. And when you think of where it was, and there's good descriptions of the clock, uh, tied to the chimney in Lewisburg. It was tied to the chimney down here. It, it's, it's a fantastic story. And to think that something maybe in some ways is delicate, that it survived all the travel. It no longer works, I understand. They didn't send the pendulum this time, but the rest of the clock uh, will be coming uh, this way. I, Wayne Wright and I had a great opportunity here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had the opportunity to visit Pallet of Care and visit Waldron Laird. And I personally thanked Walter Laird for everything he has done to preserve the history of Samuel Holland. And uh, we were supposed to go back and record his story, but we never made it, the, the, the snowstorms. But he appreciated his coming, and his face is he, still in my mind. He grinned and he said, uh, I'm not done yet. He said to Wayne Wright and I, uh, here's some things I want you guys to do that I haven't completed. And so this whole thing about the clock is, is yes, it's an instrument of science. Uh, you will get further lectures uh, about it. And, uh, but it's, it's amazing how the heck it survived all these years. And a try on, it was down there for most of the time. In my Uncle Cam's, they called it a buck house, a little house that was stored in there. And it made that journey all over. So, it, you know, when you think of it, it it's sure uh, the piece that would be symbolic of our Surveyor General. So that really is the journey of the clock. And to realize that this community was so much a part of it, and basically, nobody even knows that. So I thank uh, Faye Pound for being good enough to, to take this on and, and, and write the, a, a two-part article in the journal in uh, the year 2000, because she brought it to life again. And now we're going to keep learning about it. So as a descendant of Samuel Holland, yes, I'm going to be excited about it. But what's happening this year, you, you've got to thank so many people, so many people passionate about history to keep fighting to, to get this story where it should be. And I'm very grateful to all involved, the committee, many of the people, many of the people that pushed this story along over the years aren't even with us. But without their contribution, it wouldn't, wouldn't have had this great journey. So. Uh, who knows in a hundred years where the journey will take the clock. And I'll close it by saying yes, if the clock could talk. Thank you very much. Well, to start off, I'm certainly, uh, I, I don't have the personal kind of connection with uh, Samuel Holland and the great stories. Uh, nor the similar um, experience growing up as, as George uh, has this evening. I've known George for, for these 15 years uh, since coming to uh, Summerside and uh, 
when George would say, you know, there's stuff out there in the attics. Now I know where it was all coming from. <laughs> What have we got? Okay, we'll just look at the, uh, at the Holland map for a, a couple of minutes here. Um, the uh, the McNaught History Center and Archives is part of a larger complex, and uh, it's run by the city of Summerside. We're part of the Wyatt Heritage Properties, which uh, includes the Lepergy Cultural Center and uh, the Wyatt Historic House. That's how we started off uh, 15 years ago. Um, and then we've, uh, we have expanded to another couple of sites and uh, we've uh, adopted the role, expanded role in, in all of arts, heritage and culture for the city. Um, so, and, and we, we go under the banner as well of uh, Culture Summerside. Um, so the uh, McNaught History Center and Archives, what is it? I think we explained that about a moment ago with David, uh, David's introduction, that it, it does uh, function as a community mem memory. It's uh, certainly uh, where uh, things are accessible, uh, historical documents, and so on. Um, we're also, we're a library, and we're a, we are a research center. Um, and we are a genealogy center. So we hit quite a few bases uh, over, uh, over the run of a day or a week. Um, so it, the, we started as a community, uh, or started as part uh, of an archives for the Wyatt Collection. And then we said, okay, there's more to Summerside than the Wyatt Collection. We have to keep an eye and an ear uh, for other material that's out there from individuals and businesses and, and uh, oral histories and, and all that sort of thing. All of it uh, collectible and important. Um, and we've also taken on, of course, uh, 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 a bit of a function as a city archives uh, where uh, material that's generated by the city has been generated by the city over the years uh, is, uh, is preserved as well. Um, probably that's the, the third area where, we're, where, where we are working. Um, and uh, since we're talking about maps, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, say up front that we don't have a huge collection of, of maps uh, in our holdings. Um, but we do have access and we can provide access to uh, mapping that's online. And uh, over the years, I suspect we will be uh, gathering more material from the city as its, uh, as its uh, useful life ends and it's uh, transferred to the archives. We have grown into a year-round year operation as well. Uh, we are open to the public. I feel I have to say that uh, because so many people out there do not realize that they can come in and use our library, use our genealogy resources, and, and, and our maps uh, and other documents. Uh, that's, that's what we're there for. So where would our maps have come from? They would have had to have come from the Wyatt Collection. Not a whole lot of maps there. They would have had to have come from the community at large. And uh, so we, we uh, or, or as I say, from the city itself. Um, so what I'm going to show, What I'm going to show you is, are a few examples of the sorts of things that we have. Um, what do I do, just left click and it goes, all right. Um, so this is, this is the title, this is uh, what we're going to talk about. Um, everything on, in PEI mapping sort of goes back to Samuel Holland and his survey work. Uh, there have been other works done over the years as well. And this is what we look like as a result of, of Samuel Holland's work. 
Um, and uh, this one is called the Ashby map of 1798. It's the first time that the, uh, the uh, name of Prince Edward Island was used on a map, and it's actually about a, a year earlier than the actual decision. Um, so while I have it up there, um, it can serve as a reminder as well that um, Island imagined at the University of Prince Edward Island is uh, where you can where you can access a wonderful collection of, of uh, maps from uh, around Prince Edward Island that were uh, digitized and made available from the Public Archives and Records Office in Charlottetown. And this is this is one of those. Uh, Samuel Hall's survey, 1765. Summerside and area in, included, uh, and and uh, one of the uh, sources that we use quite a bit for the early days of Summerside is the 1841 Admiral Bayfield's hydrographic charts, uh, and. Uh, This is what it looks what it looks like here. Uh, you can see uh, this is 1841, so we're 75 years along into the development of the of, of the town, and we're we're moving from these lines here, which indicate the the farm fields and that sort of thing and pathways. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much all that was there. 1841, the first wharf was uh, placed uh, at right where Queen's Wharf is today. Um, and that was in part in response to the shipbuilding uh, efforts moving from, from uh, a shallower shipbuilding and shipping as well, a shallower location in, in Bedeck. Uh, to the, the better vantage point here, better access to the deeper waters at, at Summerside. Uh, we have Indian Head um, there. We have Holman Island, Indian Head or McCollum's Point. We have the sands, uh, the shoals there that you can see. Uh, and uh, and I, you can see some representations of buildings as well. Um, this uh, moves along at 20, uh, by about 22 years uh, to 1863, and we're looking at the lake map. It's coming up much better there than it is here, but it's good. Uh, and uh, that was uh, a, a full uh, survey and a full effort to place uh, the names of, uh, of, uh, of businesses and individuals onto, onto a map. And uh, it's a pretty standard resource. Uh, this one you can access uh, through islandregister.com. They, uh, they have the full lake map available there online. Uh, 1863 in the lake map. So we're looking at Summerside here uh, and the extent of the town at that point. Uh, I think we have Duke Street over here and we have Central Street here and Central Street really was the center of the town at that point. This past summer and again uh, in the coming summer we will uh, reinstall a, uh, uh, an interpretive exhibit along Water Street. I urge you, if you weren't able to get up to see it this last year, you, you should visit this year. But it is called Laying the Keel. And what we did was we took uh, each of these businesses here and we uh, developed, a, uh, developed a panel interpretive panel on each of them and uh, they're quite attractive and you can spend a fair amount of time uh, there reading up on reading the story of each of the businesses that were located there. And this is the lake map downtown. That's, that's the same thing 
as what we looked, what we just looked at. Yeah, a little close up. Uh, it was a pioneer town um, at, at, at that point in the 1860s, but it was also at a peak, uh, peak in the shipbuilding um, industry, um, mid-60s. Um, and transportation to and from the continent was, was uh, important as well. Now, here we have Ruger's Summerside, 1878. Um, Panoramic view, bird's eye view, uh, whatever you want to call it, and we have an example. We have a version of it back here, um, in a, a printed version. So, so you can have a look at that after. Uh, 1878. You look back and you you look at that compared to 1863. Uh, we're only 15 years on, but we've. Uh, expanded quite a bit out this way to the north and uh, not so much to the west end yet at that point. And we have the three wharves and, and we have a steamer here. And we have many, many little representations of the various buildings of Summerside. And we have found in our research uh, when we uh, uh, profile uh, heritage buildings, potential heritage buildings in Summerside, that it's, it's very useful and very uh, surprisingly accurate in, in many of the buildings as to the placement of windows and, and other openings and, and that sort of thing. And this is a close-up of the east end of town uh, from that same sketch. And you see here that there's not much familiar in the east end of town these days. Uh, we, right now, we, in this building, are way out here somewhere. In the, <laughs> the Holland College is right, well, right here somewhere. And uh, most of these buildings are gone. We still we, we may have some remnants of some of these buildings along here on uh, Woodby East, and it's now Autumn Street and, and King and Eustain over here, but uh, quite a bit of change there. This, the, most of these buildings are certainly gone. Um, and it is 1878, so there, were, there was a lot of construction um, following that. Uh, about the same time as that was happening, the work for the uh, 1880 Meacham's Atlas was taking place, and uh, here you see uh, here you see lot 17, um, and you can you can see in this case that the Meacham's Atlas was a major effort to place uh, names and uh, uh, property sizes and that sort of thing onto. Uh, a map, and uh, it's a pretty standard source. Um, it would have been purchased uh, by subscription, and uh, the uh, you can see here down in the corner. Here's here's Summerside. Uh, I have next. I think it's Summerside. Summerside showing the uh, the out. Outside lots, basically, they they ha don't give much detail down here in the in the town part, because we saw that on Ruger's and uh, up here you can see the various landowners and uh, and that sort of thing. So that's that's very helpful. Um, on a, another source that we do have, um, either in microfilm or in hard copy, are insurance maps. And again, that uh, they tell an important uh, important things about the about the development of the town, especially useful uh, for researching uh, the stories of uh, various uh, historical buildings. Um, this one here, fifty seven summer. Okay, so we're looking at the uh, the post the old post office, eighteen eighty six to nineteen fifty two. Uh, and then later adopted as, as the town hall. 
became became the town hall after the fire of 1955 destroyed uh, the lovely town hall that we had and I'm not sure how many records but I suspect um, many that uh, that were there that uh, um, that were stored there and uh, we have had occasion over the last few years to have someone co come forward and with uh, actual minutes of town council meetings uh, from about two or three years in the late 30s, night, early 40s. And that was because a family member had been a clerk or a recording or a councillor or something and had taken uh, those copies, their own copy, home. and uh, and. So we're still hoping there's more of that, more of that out there. Uh, okay, so that's where this is. Um, and we have then the city, city hall expanded in 2003. Um, here's another one. Now we're on Queen Street, the corner of Queen, the journal building, uh, and, and heading west um, along water. And you can see uh, several buildings there that certainly aren't there uh, anymore, except this one is, and that is the uh, PEI Bag Company, an interesting old warehouse built uh, about the time of the railway. Uh, there you see the railway line right here, and a little spur going into where John Lafergy would have, would have uh, uh, shipped material from his warehouse. Uh, so that one is still there, the journal is still there, and uh, there is another one here that is, is it's sort of going on the horizontal line there, and that is actually Kelly's Flower Shop. It was moved in 1921, we found out after years of waiting <laughs> and looking and wondering. Uh, we're pretty sure that's the building, but we didn't know when it was, and we just tripped upon it in the newspapers. By the way, speaking of newspapers, we have a project right now where you can come into the archives and read as much of the journal, the Journal Pioneer, uh, those other newspapers that were published in Summerside, to your heart's content. And all you need to do is just make notes of the interesting ads, the advertisements that are interesting to you. So contact Jean McKay at the McNaught History Center and you can come in from anywhere. It doesn't mean you don't have to be a resident of Summerside. You just have to have an interest to come in and do that and record that and be part of the program that, that marks the 150th anniversary of the, the journal in Summerside. Okay, that's the little commercial done. Uh, <laughs> and the map of the fire, of course, the Great Fire of 1906. I think this is the uh, version that we, uh, we cleaned up and made ready for uh, Windsor Corny's book on the history of the fire department. 150 buildings starting down here and sweeping from the southeast to the northwest in, uh, was it October, in a southeasterly gale. And uh, uh, so there's another, another map, resource, sketch really, um, from the town's history. Uh, back to the insurance maps. Um, it, we have them from 1884, 1903, 1917, and then we have some later ones from 19, from the 1950s. Many of these, are, the gold uh, insurances were, maps were updated uh, several times between, in the, in the early century. Okay, the reason this is here, uh, this is Water Street, and this is uh, what you might know as the Dooley's building right now. Uh, it is uh, the replacement for all of this street right here, south side, was wiped out in 1916. Ten years after the 1906 uh, fire that, st that struck the residential area in 1916, uh, in December, 
this area, the business area was wiped out on this side of the street, up Central Street, along this side, the north side of water, over to Summer. And uh, so this is an, a rebuild, basically, showing the new, new buildings and the blank places. And here, at some point or another, somebody has uh, penciled in the Kelly's Flower Shop. Uh, so it was after, uh, went after 1921. Um, this is a telephone building. This is, was our first telephone uh, exchange building. And you'll notice that it is uh, pretty much on the same location as the one that has been there lately, Bell Alliant, uh, uh, just across from the credit union. Um, so that's these. These are there are many details. The go the insurance maps will tell you about the building. They'll tell you the size. They'll tell you how many floors. They'll tell you um, uh, cladding often and and other details. Um, and here's water in Queen. That's basically the same as what I I showed you before. This would be St Stephen Street here, I believe. Yes. And uh, this is central. Uh, on to a few topographical maps. Um, and this, yes, it's a better picture up there every time. About 1940, early 1940s, and we have the, okay, thank you. Uh, and we have the base, the uh, our CAF station uh, established there. Uh, and again, another whole uh, layer of uh, information, many layers of information that are recorded on that. Again, here we see the same area that we saw in 1841 on the Bayfield map and can see the changes there. Uh, Gulf Shore Cottages, about 1940. Gulf Shore was down, be down below the Summerside Golf Club, and they were down here at Phelan Point. Uh, the rifle range was over here, uh, and uh, eventually some of these cottages were moved into town. Um, and here, to the east end of town, is another area where we have cottages, cottages developing in the, in the 20s and the, and the 30s. Uh, and so we have a little circle of cottages there. We have a whole bunch of little cottages here. And, this is, and, and some buildings, cottages there as well. This is all developed now, uh, but you still see some of the, some of the smaller buildings in there. Uh, these are gone, of course, and these are gone. Um, but a good swimming area down that way. Uh, and then th that's a close-up. Well, by the 20s, we sort of accepted motor vehicles, and we, uh, we were into road building and uh, travel by the motor vehicle. And here is a, an advertising uh, insert from Summerside uh, that uh, appeared on a larger, on quite a larger map. And you, you, see, um, you see the airport here. It's, it, uh, 1934 was the first year of our little municipal airport. It lasted for about five years till the, till the uh, RCAF station came in and in 4041. Um, the Silver Black Fox is noted here as well with the national headquarters of the Dominion, Dominion Experimental um, Fox Farm. Uh, Corny Brothers, big advertisers. This is the, and you can see it pointing right over to their shop, which is, was this, the old uh, Salvation Army. Um, there's a pizza place in there, and it seems to be apartments. Anyway, we. Uh, these things allow us to, to trace the history and development of the town. Lots of topographical. 
Um, we're going to wrap up with uh, two or three from, from the Technical Services Department. Um, as I say, many uh, of the maps and so on are still within, are, are still being used. Um, but oh, one day we'll, we'll inherit some of these at the, at the archives. These are the municipal boundaries. Uh, this is the zoning map. Uh, I'm glad I'm not working on that one. <laughs> but uh, many, many colors, and I'm, I know that they all mean uh, different things and different variations. Um, and then I think there's one more uh, with the contours of the town. Where does the natural drainage go, or did it, or would it if we didn't have uh, a sewer and uh, water mains and that sort of thing? Uh, there, there's a whole, um, there's a whole area to be visited there with lots of lovely maps and 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 what they, what they mean. Um, And now we're back to Samuel Holland. Um, we, I will mention before I, I stop that we've had a couple of uh, uh, a couple of our uh, surveyors from the uh, who lived in the Summerside area. Uh, one was by the name of Alexander uh, Anderson, actually from Bedeck, came into Summerside, uh, spent his last years here at the home of. Uh, another surveyor by the name of John Clay and uh, John Clay pursued his his career um, he would only have been 20 or 25 years younger than than the senior um, and it was at uh, John Clay's house that Anderson passed away um, if you know the Bedeck if you know the King Cora Road uh, once known as the Anderson Road then that's where the name is coming from. So quite a bit of surveying activity in this area. And John Clay uh, was the person who built uh, the McNaught History Center and archives in 1887. So we, we, we feel quite connected to one surveyor at least. Thank you.